I'm Margaret Flowers, your host for this conversation with Dr. Susan Domchak. Dr. Domchak is a BCRF investigator and a member of our scientific advisory board and an expert in breast cancers that are caused by mutations in the BRCA genes. We've asked Dr. Domchek to join us today to talk to us about a study that was reported at the recent ASCO meeting that could have big implications for some breast cancer patients. Dr. Domchek, thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule. I'd like to begin by just asking you to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about the work that you do. Well, thanks so much for having me. As uh, mentioned, I've been a BCRF investigator for 10 years now, and this has been a tremendous asset to the ability to get research done and to look for the newest and most innovative areas to do work. My, I am a medical oncologist. I see patients with breast cancer, but I also have a specialization in genetics. So I see individuals who have mutations in genes such as BRCA1 and BRCA2 and have an increased risk of developing cancers. And over the years, what we've learned is not only does information about an individual's inherited genetics help determine what risk their cancer, what, what cancer risk they have, but also helps us figure out exactly how to treat them. And as you'll hear, this particular study is a, is a great example of that and is a major step forward in our field. Great. So the study that we're talking about is the Olympia, Olympia trial uh, in which patients who had treatable or early, early stage breast cancer and carried an uh, inherited mutation in the BRCA gene or were, had a, a breast cancer that was HER2 negative. Um, had received a laparib, which goes by the, the drug name of Lymparza, um, or placebo. And this was after they had received their normal standard care of treatment, but were considered a high risk um, for recurrence. And I was wondering if we could start by just asking you to tell us a little bit about this drug, Olaparib. It belongs to this class of drugs called PARP inhibitors. What are they and how do they work? And how, why is it this group of, of patients particularly good candidates for this type of drug? When BRCA1 and BRCA2 were first discovered, we didn't really know much about how they functioned in the cell. And, but we, do, did, we did know that if you had a mutation or another word for that is a pathogenic variant in one of these genes, you had an increased risk of cancer. But as our basic science colleagues figured out exactly how these genes works. We could figure out that if you have a, a inherited gene mutation in say BRCA1, that the vast majority of the time your tumor does not have BRCA1 protein present and actively working. And why that matters is because BRCA1 and BRCA2 are, in, are, are helpful. And I think this is oftentimes where uh, people have this a little bit wrong, but we all have BRCA1 and 2 genes, and those proteins help repair DNA damage. So they're really critically important. And tumors that don't have functional BRCA1 or BRCA2 don't repair DNA damage correctly. And so we couldn't think of a way, at least I certainly couldn't imagine a way that you could target for therapy a protein that's turned off. Most of the things that we target in cancer, particularly breast cancer, are things that are turned on. You have an estrogen receptor positive cancer, so we target estrogen receptors. You have a HER2 new positive cancer that's activated, we target that. How to target things that are lost is actually much more complicated. So extremely, extremely clever people, including Alan Ashworth, and really led by Alan Ashworth, one of our BCRF investigators, figured out that you could uh, use these PARP inhibitors, which themselves inhibit a different type of DNA repair pathway. And we call this whole concept synthetic lethality, which is if you repair one DNA repair pathway, like BRCA1 related DNA damage repair, the cell can live. If you inhibit a different type of DNA repair pathway, like PARP inhibitors do, the cell can live. But if you, rec if you inhibit both, the cell can't live. It's too much and it, and it dies. And that's synthetic lethality. 
So once that was figured out, these PARP inhibitors, which is how they work, and Olaparib is the drug we'll talk about today. Palazilbrib is also another one of the PARP inhibitors relevant to breast cancer. And there's others like Lucaparib and Norapirib. But these PARP inhibitors, all of a sudden, became sort of a way to target tumors that had homologous recombination repair deficiency, and as illustrated by BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. So in breast cancer, um, we have two drugs, Olaparib and Talazoprib, approved for advanced breast cancer. So breast cancer that spread outside the breast, in the bones, the liver, the lungs, metastatic breast cancer. And those trials, including the Olympiad and Infraca trials, I don't come up with these names, by the way. I'm not that clever. That's how we try to keep track of them. In those trials, uh, the investigators, and uh, I was very involved with one of these studies, uh, compared Olaparib, for instance, to standard of care chemotherapy. And what we saw was that the PARP inhibitors were actually better than standard of care chemotherapy in a metastatic setting. And so that was great. And that led to the first FDA approvals. But where we are now in the trial that we're talking about today takes it in earlier stage. And why that's so important, as we'll talk about, is that when we treat metastatic breast cancer, our goals are to make people feel as well as possible for as long as possible. But it's rare that we really cure people. That is our goal. We constantly want to do better with that. But the real impact that we have on curing people, having their cancer go away forever and never come back, is in the earlier stage setting. So that's what we call adjuvant therapy, when people have had, for instance, their breast, their breast surgery, and now we're giving drugs to prevent cancer from ever coming back. Um, and so this study, Olympia, enrolled individuals who had BRCA1 or 2 mutations, and again, were at high risk for their cancer coming back. So this wasn't all patients that had BRCA1 or 2 mutations. These were individuals with triple negative breast cancer whose tumors were over two centimeters or had positive lymph nodes, or individuals who had had preoperative chemotherapy and had cancer left, and for ER positive tumors that had either four positive lymph nodes or quite a bit of cancer left after administration of the chemotherapy. So in those women and men, um, they were randomly assigned after all their regular treatment to receive either a laparib or a placebo pill. And there were over 1,800 patients in this trial, which by the way, is a testament to the power of collaborative Ooh. and international research. And there were BCRF investigators from all over who were part of this trial. And so what was amazing is that the women who received, or the women and men who received a laparib were much less likely to get their cancer back, including outside their breast, metastatic disease. And so this is a, this is a really big advance um, we don't yet have data that it makes people live longer. Um, that's just because we haven't had long enough follow-up time, uh, but it really is trending in that direction and we have to wait and make sure, uh, but that's important. The other really important thing is that quality of life is critically important and toxicity of the medication. And what we saw was that although there are side effects to elaborate, the quality of life of individuals on, on a lap was actually really pretty good um, and no major differences between the two groups, although there are differences in certain, uh, certain side effects. And lastly, there were no big changes in things that, that we could have seen. For instance, we don't see, at least at this point, an excess risk of leukemia or other cancers like that. So that's extremely important as well. So this really is sort of a game changer that individuals who have, who have BRCA1 or 2 mutations and have high risk early stage cancers should um, have a discussion and usually should get a lab for a year after completion of their therapy. Well, that goes to my, my next question. And, and this really is, I am really glad you put it in that context because I really appreciate um, just how important these results are for, for patients. And you know, thinking about this patient population who have a, a genetic and um, susceptibility to breast cancer. They are often diagnosed earlier. They are often diagnosed with more aggressive breast cancers. 
And so I can see this impacting a group of patients where, you know, we've really had very limited options for up until this time. So my question is, you know, are, is this available to patients now who fit into this group or is there any other FDA approval that needs to take place before it's approved for the, in this particular setting? Yes, it's, it's, it's a really great and important question and I'll answer it possibly two ways. Uh, at the current time, there is not FDA approval for the use of elaborate in the adjuvant setting, this exact setting that we're talking about. Um, that is, that is planned. You know, the the, uh, the the plan of submitting those documents to the FDA and getting that for approval um, is you know planned. Um, that's different from can you actually give the drug at this point? So, um, what we call off-label use definitely occurs in oncology. Um, and uh, so far, even though my my numbers are small uh, uh, because th these data only became recently available. Um, I have been able to have insurance cover uh, this, this drug. And I do think that the data are compelling enough uh, that we should be trying. Now, I want to be clear, though, that this drug is not for everyone. Um, even BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers can have very early stage cancers or uh, estrogen receptor positive cancers that are small and lymph node negative. And this drug does have side effects. So I still believe that you know, not everybody, not every BRCA1 or 2 mutation carrier uh, should get this medication. And we need to be, we need to be thoughtful about weighing sort of the risks and benefits. But in the group that was included in the trial, those particularly high-risk patients, yes, I think that they, uh, they should get the medication. This immediately rises, uh, you know, leads to a next question that you might have for me is, okay, well, how should we think about genetic testing in this setting? So triple negative breast cancers, everybody who has a triple negative breast cancer should get genetic testing. And you know, the reason why is because you know, the uh, BRCA1 mutation-related cancers, 85% of the time are triple negative. And individuals with triple negative breast cancer are much more likely to have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 or PALB2 mutation. And even though PALB2 wasn't directly tested in this study, these drugs likely work in, in those cases as well. So all triple negative breast cancer patients should get genetic testing. Now, estrogen receptor positive cancers, that's that is different. And I, I, I wanna be clear that if you are a 70 year old woman uh, with a lymph node negative ER positive cancer, you know, Olaparib is probably not a good addition whether you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation or not. You know, so, so I, I, I do wanna make sure that we, we realize that we're not going to be giving a labyrinth, you know, to everybody. And a 70-year-old woman with an ER-positive tumor, if she's not of Jewish descent and has no family history, is exceedingly unlikely to have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Uh, so if, it's, if, if that individual wishes to get tested, there are ways to do it. But I do think it's important to differentiate triple negative breast cancers have a high risk of BRCA1 and 2, and then very high risk ER positive breast cancers where you might consider using a lab rib, that's another situation where individuals should get tested to determine therapeutic benefit apart from all the other reasons that we do genetic testing. I wanna put you on the spot and you can, you can couch your answer in whatever yeah. makes you feel comfortable, but do we have a sense Based, you know, given that this is still early data, I think um, if I recall two and a half years of follow-up or something like that, and um, certainly, you know, the, the trial is expected to follow patients for the next 10 or 20 years, I think. Um, so it's very early and there's a lot, you know, we still don't know what the outcomes of these, these women will be, but can we have a, do we have a sense of, of the, the lives that are being saved by just being able to add another drug to a regimen in, in a, a group of high-risk um, patients like this? The, um, I don't know the exact answer yet because we don't have the survival benefit. But generally speaking, um, distant disease-free survival tracks pretty well with eventual overall survival. You know, and that benefit may be as high as 8% in this situation, which is huge. And so I think this is going to be most impactful for triple negative breast cancer patients. And again, that's not to say that there isn't benefit 
in, in ER positive. But when we think about the available options we have in triple negative breast cancer, the idea of having something that can change outcome that much is huge. And 75% and of the patients on this study were triple negative. So this is where we have like, so, so in, that, in, in that situation, the value you know, uh, could be extremely high. Now, about you know, 10%, 10 to 15%, depending on the age of triple negative breast cancers, you know, have BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So that's not nothing. That is a good chunk. And those tend to be really young women. And, uh, and so the, the median age in this, five, in this study was in the 40s. I mean, these are young people. Um, and so, um, and the other thing I'd like to just add, which, which, which we know through BCRF investigators, but we just have to keep making clear, um, we have a disparity in genetic testing in this country where we, uh, white women and white, uh, uh, well-educated um, women in a higher socioeconomic class are much more likely to get genetic testing and underrepresented minorities are individuals in a lower socioeconomic class. We need to make sure that we are testing like every triple negative breast cancer, which we are not out in the community. It's not happening. Just like every ovarian cancer patient should get tested. And if the issue of therapeutics, you know, pushes that forward even harder and drives the thing we absolutely must know because we cannot deprive these individuals of a potentially life-saving medication, that's great because that gap just absolutely must close.